Hi, good evening. It's uh, exciting to be here. My name is Jeff Case, and I am the Senior Vice President of North Star International, and we are excited for this evening's fireside. We would like to welcome all those who are following along at home, uh, across the U.S., across the world. We know that we have friends and family that extend across Europe, across Asia, even down into Australia and New Zealand. So uh, welcome to everyone who could attend this evening. Um, I, before we get started, I just want to kind of uh, uh, hope that, uh, this, that the Spirit is with you tonight as we um, have this pr uh, production. Uh, we have a wonderful program for you, so please stay tuned. We're going to start by having an opening prayer uh, by our lovely Victoria Adam, after which we'll have a musical number, a song called Oh Love, um, that will be presented. And uh, this will be sung by Kevin Wright, Seth Williams, Sarah Langford, and Cynthia Miller. Uh, following that, we'll have a a short video about the Voices of Hope project, and uh, we will uh, go to that point. Thank you.
Our Father in heaven, as we come before thee this evening worldwide, we pray, Father, that thy spirit will continue to be with us, that we may have open hearts and open minds to understand the journeys that each of us have to take and are taking. Will thou, Spirit, strengthen us as we learn and as we grow into our experiences here in mortality, that we may understand the benefits and the purpose of each of our lives. We pray that we may always have the strength within us not to battle, but to understand, to realize that this is a journey of hope, love, charity, and faith, that we may stay strong within the gospel principles, that we may understand them in a different way, perhaps, than that which we have been taught. Father, we ask that we may always have the guidance and the direction that we may influence those that are around us. And we know that there are many that are struggling, and we pray for them as well that they may find comfort in thy soul and in thy teaching. Father, we're indeed really grateful for this experience of being here this evening to enjoy each other's company and to have a fireside that will strengthen us in times of need. We're indeed really grateful for those that have prepared so diligently for this uh, fireside this evening. And these things we want to thank thee for and we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Victoria, that was just wonderful. I wanted to start tonight by just thanking uh, Jenny Davis and Jerry Lozano who are uh, so diligent in organizing these events and this fireside in particular. Uh, their efforts are a truly a blessing to the entire North Star family. And also, we're grateful for Nathaniel at uh, Mustache Power Productions for hosting us this evening and allowing us to uh, use his facilities. Uh, a couple of announcements. I want to talk really fast about the uh, up upcoming North Star Conference. This is the highlight of my year, and I'm grateful that we are able to put together a great conference. Uh, the annual conference will be from June 10th through the 13th. And for the first time ever, we will have a conference that will be available both in person and virtually. We will be following the CDC guidelines at that time of the conference, and we hope that this will open up the doors to more people to attend and also to bring in people from around the world. Um, we will have uh, anyone who attends virtually will have the option to do, attend any of the breakout sessions and all the keynote speakers. Uh, the opening social will be on June 10th on that Thursday evening at 6.30 p.m. for anyone who is here uh, in time, and, and especially the first-timers, if this is your first conference, we invite you to come at 6.30. Um, the main conference with keynotes and the breakouts will be June 11 and 12 at the uh, Salt Lake City Sheraton Hotel. If you were here last year, uh, it's in the same place. Um, and then we have a testimony meeting on Sunday, June 13th from 9 until 11 o'clock, also at the Sheraton. I want to remind you that uh, well, watch for upcoming announcements about the conference. Registration will open up in the next couple of weeks, so stay tuned. Uh, sign up for our email distribution. Uh, go online. Uh, social media uh, will have all the information available to you. Um, the order of uh, the fireside tonight, we're going to have a brief video presentation discussing uh, the Voices of Hope project. Uh, followed by uh, a pre-recorded message from uh, Melissa uh, Inoue, and she will be speaking on biodiversity in Zion. Um, as a way of introduction, if you're not familiar with her work, uh, Melissa Inoue is a senior lecturer in Asian studies at the University of Auckland and a historian at the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She received her PhD in East Asian Languages and Civilizations from Harvard University. She is the author of two books. The first is China's True Genius, Charisma and Its Limits in Chinese Christianity, and a book titled Crossings, a bald Asian-American Latter-day Saint woman scholars ventures through life, death, cancer, and motherhood, not necessarily in that order. She and her husband Joseph have four children, botanically named Bean, Sprout, Leaf, and Shoot. I, I love that so much. 
Other fun facts about Melissa. She has a dog named Birdie, uh, currently lives in Draper. Her favorite food is ice cream, but it must be served on a cone. She likes to go shooting in the desert and can stand on her head for a very long time. And I'm hoping, beyond hope, that we get a demonstration of the headstand tonight during her presentation. So uh, we'll go to that point in the program and then we'll, uh, we'll close after uh, Melissa's uh, lecture. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeff Case. Uh, you've already heard enough from me tonight, but I'm gonna talk a bit more uh, with my friend Aaron. We're gonna talk a little bit about how we found North Star and the impact that Voices of Hope has had on us tonight. We have a couple new project managers with Voices of Hope. Sally and Garrett Ferguson, and they've got some great ideas for how to move this project forward. So hopefully we can generate some excitement tonight. But I'll let Aaron introduce himself, and uh, we'll talk a bit about our experiences. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Aaron Carter. Um, I am fairly new to the North Star community. Um, it's something I just learned about just last summer, so mm. I'm not even a year yet. And a little bit about me, a little background. Um, so I was uh, married to my wife, Emily, for almost 15 years. Uh, we have four beautiful children, um, ages 11 down to almost three. Mm. So life is quite busy around here. And um, all my life, um, you know, knowing um, that I had these experiences, um, same-sex attraction and not really knowing where to turn to, being on my own a lot um, with this um, brought a lot of challenges um, throughout my life. and. Last year, I had uh, been seeing a therapist for a while to just talk through these um, issues I was having and um, needing support. And, and through our discussions, um, North Star actually came up and my therapist suggested that I check it out. And I'd actually never heard of North Star before. Um, growing up in California, where we were before Utah, um, I'd never known anyone in my situation. Um, I knew we were out there, uh, I knew that I wasn't the only one, but um, I'd never made any friends or, or known anyone to talk to that was going through these things, so I was always uh, feeling pretty alone and um, often frustrated with, with how to just carry on sometimes. Um, so, you know, being introduced to North Star um, and Voices of Hope was, was quite life-changing to me. Um, you know, I went to the website and the first thing you see is the Voices of Hope, you know, being advertised. and. Um, I was just drawn right in and um, watching every video. I think I watched them all in a matter just of a few days and um, they were certainly inspiring to me to actually, you know, see faces and hear voices of people who completely understood what I was going through and then to see how they were able to overcome the challenges that they faced in their lives and then being able to see that through um, just was so inspiring to me. It was music to my ears. It was it was exactly what I needed for my time, my life at that time. Um, so I've just been so grateful and and you know for the courage for those who who decided to come forward and, and share their stories. I know that that wasn't easy yeah. and um, it was definitely something that I needed. So yeah. yeah, and I'm so glad you did because through that we were connected and became friends. That's right. Because uh, not only was he not alone. He was actually in the same ward that my in-laws are in, and they discovered some commonalities. I think your wife noticed that yes. perhaps we might be connected? Yes. So I'm, I was a night shift nurse in California, working one late night at one in the morning. I get a frantic text from my wife, Emily, because she was also loving the Voices of Hope videos as well. Um, she, we stumbled across your video mm -hmm. and figured out that, you know, your wife was, um, you know, family lived in the town we were in. So very, very small world, super exciting. Um, yeah, again, just made it more personal and just, it was just really fun. So, yeah, I think we can, a lot of us can relate to that sense of isolation, that aloneness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's a, before we found this community, I think a lot of us can relate to that. I, that's. Uh, that was kind of my story as well, feeling very isolated, very alone. I mean, imagine I was a, a music major at BYU in the 90s and I lived in the Fine Arts Center and I thought I was the only gay kid on campus. Uh, there was just no, no connection really. Um, but through my therapist that I was working with at the time, and yes, the common theme here is go to therapy. Um, my therapist also suggested that I go to a support group. Uh, it was a different group at that time. I went a few times, made a couple of good friends, but I, I, the overall tone of things uh, didn't really resonate with me. I found some useful t points, 
some tidbits. It didn't really resonate with me, so I took my few friends and then I kind of left the whole LGBTQ LDS world for about a decade and a half until uh, after coming out to a ward member in San Antonio, Texas, he presented me with a book called Voices of Hope, edited and written by Ty Mansfield. And I, uh, it, it was a whole different narrative. And I remember just reading through this thinking, uh, we've, we as a culture have really evolved and this community has sprung up called North Star that is a different community than what I'd experienced before. And I remember just sitting in a fast food restaurant in my army uniform. I was warned by this friend, by the way, don't read this in public, but here I was reading it in public anyway, and just like tears streaming down my face uncontrollably. Uh, I looked like a hot mess, but that's okay. What I was feeling was the spirit, and what I was feeling was connection and people with whom I jived, right? So we're all kind of like going through life on like a music wave, right? We're kind of... Uh, our own frequency, yeah. tone, timbre, right? And, and when we find people that kind of jive with us, it amplifies mm. the sound, it amplifies the music. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of what Voice of Hope did for me, that, that initial book, and then of course the website. And uh, it has changed my life in many ways. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, me too. And yeah, music to my ears, just what I needed, and so inspiring to to stay on this covenant path, you know, to see those this testimony is being born in the videos, um, certainly inspired my own testimony and, um, you know, definitely gave me the, the strength to keep, keep pressing forward. So yeah, yeah been wonderful. And so some of these new initiatives that are coming out, we still have lots of content to release because I know many of you have recorded content and, and we are getting through that, that, the, the content to put it out there, but we also have new plans in the works as well. We really want to amplify all of our voices so that it can join a full chorus, thousands of voices, right, to, in, in many languages, to reach all corners of the earth, to let people know that uh, there is hope, there is a way forward, that through Christ and our a, a relationship with Christ, um, we can really kind of come together as a community and find hope, and uh, hope that in, in the paths that we're taking, we, and we recognize there are lots of paths that people take, but for those who are in this path, that there is hope, there is a community, and we hope to push this out in many different ways. So I uh, look forward to what's coming up. There's some really exciting things. Uh, I'm, I'm very energized for what's about to come down the pipe. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the fireside. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm honored and very humbled. Thanks so much for the extraordinary work you do as individuals and as a community. And thanks for inviting me to speak and share some thoughts with you. Spring has come and I've been spending a lot of time in this small wetland park across the street from my house. There's two ponds, one big, one small. The big pond is the home of the Canada geese. We hear them honking as they come in for a landing, coordinating their descent. The little pond has a lot of ducks, mostly mallards. In the spring, they nest in the bushes and vigilant mothers shepherd little squads of ducklings into the water. Sometimes big white pelicans come and sometimes there are herons. Recently, my kids and I have learned that the wetlands beauty is under threat. It's hard to keep everything in balance. The banks of the little pond are eroded because of the large population of ducks. These ducks have eaten all the vegetation that normally would grow on the banks and hold the soil in place. The upland areas are quickly becoming overrun with Russian olives, an invasive tree that grows so quickly it crowds out the other trees. Russian olives are so hardy, even when you cut them down at the base, they just sprout suckers and come back. The pond once had another catchment basin, a third pond, but this basin has been completely filled in by the most pernicious weed of all, Phragmites. They look nice and fluffy with golden heads of seeds blowing in the wind. But like Russian olives, Phragmites are invasive. They spread through seeds blown through the air and through roots that spread out horizontally below ground. They grow fast and they take over until there's no longer any room for other native plants usually found in wetland areas like bulrushes, sedges, willows and cattails. Utah Lake is currently overrun with Phragmites. But just in the past 20 years, this infestation has come in. And not only have the Phragmites crowded out the other plants, but they've also literally changed the levels of water that are available in the lake. And they've eliminated habitat critical to certain species, such as the June sucker. Currently, there's a huge restoration plan underway to remove the Phragmites and help native species reestablish. This will restore the network of interactions between plants, water, fish, and insects to a healthy level of complexity. Biodiversity, scientists tell us, is not simply a matter of nature being quirky and creating a lot of weird stuff. 
it's fundamental to a sustaining life on the planet itself. Not just the lives of dune suckers, but all life, the food that grows, the water we drink, the seasons, and the stable weather on which human beings depend. Biodiversity of species on the living planet is like rivets on the wing of a plane. The loss of one or two will not crash the plane, but the more that are lost, the more likelihood there is of a serious problem. Science tells us that incredibly diversity of life supports life itself. Without this diversity, these life-sustaining systems are in danger of collapse. With the decline of the immense forests that soaked up carbon, the planet itself is warming. With the use of certain pesticides, the pollinating insects and birds on which we rely for a third of all the food we eat are threatened. So biodiversity is not just a pleasing ornamentation or embellishment. It is not a mistake or an anomaly. Biodiversity is essential to the design of life. Biodiversity creates a greater organism, a world that is living with its many components, the way a body is alive with mitochondria, muscle fibers, neural networks, and keratin. I believe this is the case not only with plants and animals, but also with humans, the children of God. We are all individuals, and we are also part of God's family. You may think that this has taken a long time to illustrate a point that diversity is beautiful or diversity is important, but I'm not trying to speak metaphorically. My point is that diversity is essential to life. Without incredible variety and complex difference, there is no life. If one really believes that our heavenly father and mother created the earth and the solar system and the universe, setting the planets in motion, causing stars to shine with energy, setting in motion infinite chains of rea chain reactions of species developing and interacting with each other, creating the webs and cycles of life of which we human beings are a part. If one really believes us, and I do, then I think it is reasonable to say that principles of their power and purpose can be observed in the physical world. In the book of Moses from scripture revealed by Joseph Smith, God says to Enoch, behold, all things have their likeness and all things are created and made to bear record of me, both things which are temporal and things which are spiritual, things which are in the heavens above and things which are on the earth and things which are in the earth and things which are under the earth, both above and beneath, all things bear record of me. That's Moses chapter six, verse 63. Understanding that all living things exist together in a system helps us to dismiss the notion of life as a zero sum game, predator or prey, eat or be eaten with organisms at the top of the food chain and organisms at the bottom. The life of a mountain lion is no less stressful than the life of a deer. And the life of a deer is no less stressful than the life of the slender grasses and young trees they eat. As God's children connected to each other, not just by the physical space on the planet we share, but by our divine nature and eternal kinship, we cannot be separated from each other. Our welfare is one. God's work is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of all the nearly numberless people who have ever lived on the earth. Paul's book about fellow Christians as members of the body of Christ. But from the perspective of this passage in Moses, the work is much greater than that. Somehow our theology has to make sense of all humanity, all living things in their great numbers as beings who are known to God and whose welfare is provided for. This is hard. Moses came into God's presence and spoke with God face to face and saw everything that God sees uh, in this passage in the book of Moses. He cast his eyes over all the inhabitants of the earth. The scriptural text doesn't say human beings, but it uses the word things. So this could actually mean all of being things on the earth, including the penguins and the herons and the peng um, pelicans. Moses saw everything and was completely gobsmacked. Moses asked God, tell me, I pray thee, why these things are so and by what thou madest them. God answered, for my own purposes have I made these things. Here is wisdom and it remaineth in me. Innumerable are they unto men, but all things are numbered, numbered unto me, for they are mine and I know them. That's Moses chapter one, verses 31, 35. So God, our heavenly father and mother are not overwhelmed by the diversity of life and the multiplicity of their children. They can take plurality in stride. They acknowledge that ordinary mortals can't wrap their minds around a variety of this magnitude, just how babies get overstimulated in a crowded, noisy place and shut down. Obviously it's pretty hard for us to even begin to comprehend what God sees and understands. But the big picture we get at the beginning of the book of Moses is that God's power drives and animates this diversity and variety of life. And that while mortal beings tend to narrow their focus, to resort to dualities, to exclude complexity, to center everything around themselves in order to wrap their minds around what's before them, God can work with immense plurality. In that same book of scripture where God is declaring their work and their glory, 
to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of their children, God also gives an explanation about how this was supposed to come about. Quote, in the Garden of Eden, gave I unto men and women their agency. I have said and also given commandment that they should love one another. They should choose me, their father. But behold, they are without affection and they hate their own blood. That's Moses chapter 7, verses 32 to 33. To rephrase this, God gave their children the choice to love one another and to love God, a repeating of the two great commandments, but in reverse order, as Terrell Givens has recently pointed out. The heavens weep because people choose not to love one another. Clearly, making this choice isn't easy because of our many differences, but it is this process of learning to choose one another, to love one another, despite our differences, that leads to immortality and eternal life. Latter-day Saints believe that this was the risk inherent in God's plan, a risk that was avoided in Satan's plan. In Satan's plan for human redemption, people would be forced to make the correct choices and none of us would be allowed to screw up. There would be no diversity whatsoever. We would all have Phragmites. We would get used to Phragmites and would not cultivate the potential for complexity, maturity, the vast experience in our divine nature. In God's plan, there would be immense variety innumerable differences causing us to frequently fail to choose one another and thereby to fail to choose God. But because of the difficulty of the task, when we did figure out how to bridge our differences and understand from multiple perspectives, we would have come closer to seeing as God sees. This is why I believe when God created the natural world, they made sure to create it with such biodiversity. And when God created humankind, they made sure to create us with such human diversity in our physical characteristics, linguistic expression, national circumstances, sexual orientation, family culture, religious traditions, and so on. To be sure, these differences can be confounding and a regular source of conflict and pain. But God did not intend for us to learn to follow them in a world of only Phragmites. God wants us to live rich lives connected to many others in a complex web of interaction and interdependence with each individual using distinctive gifts to bless all of God's children and help them achieve their divine potential. In the remainder of the time that follows, I'll give six examples of gifts that we, the children of God, can offer each other as we draw on our divine differences. One, acceptance. Two, surprise. Three, accountability. Four, something worse. Five, something concrete. Six, burdens. I'm speaking to a diverse audience and I wanna make it clear that I'm not prescribing gifts or actions for everyone. I'm just sharing the things that have come to my mind, thinking of the gifts that people have given me that grow out of the wide spaces between us and reflecting on how I can give these same gifts to others. First, acceptance. If Satan's plan were the plan, there would be no need to accept one another because there would be no need for negotiated relationships. When we extend ourselves to accept others as they are, we both show those others we value them and also invite them to value us. Through subtle gestures, we can dem demonstrate we believe others belong. We can demonstrate we're trying to help others belong. We can demonstrate we believe we belong and claim a place within a local cultural context and invite others to extend themselves. There are a lot of contingencies. This is why acceptance is never an entitlement, but a gift. And this is also why inviting acceptance from others is never an act of passive fragility, but also a gift. Being a bald woman, I've learned a lot about putting yourself out there and getting burned. I get called sir all the time, most recently this Thursday at Harmon's. I could work a bit harder to remove this point of vulnerability with regard to my physical appearance. I could wear a wig or dangly earrings or lots of makeup or form-fitting dresses to spare store employees the mistake of treating me as a man when actually I'm a woman. But I have many things on my plate that worry me more than this, like parenting and taking for the dog for a walk in the mountains and avoiding deadly viruses. I will just have to be bald and people will just have to deal with it. I will just have to deal with them. When we moved into our new ward in Draper, my husband and I gave the ritual welcome to the ward talks over the pulpit. I gave my own name, Melissa in a way, and my husband gave his. In the Sunday school lesson following the sacrament meeting, the Sunday school teacher very graciously thanked me for my talk, though he referred to me by my husband's name, Sister McMullen. Inwardly, I sighed a little sigh about Mormon patriarchy and the overwhelming tendency people have to husband die as a woman, but whatever, it was just the first week. From the back row, a woman's voice called out, why don't you use her real name? The teacher looked a bit surprised, then looked to me for clarification. 
In a way, I said happily, sister in a way. Sister in a way, he corrected himself. By calling me by my own name and not my husband's, which was different from the convention of many in the ward, that sister in the back row gave me a gift. So did the Sunday school teacher. Members of this audience will doubtless have many stories to tell, positive and negative, of the gift of acceptance. Receiving it is the gift of extending oneself to others, of making small adjustments to one's modus operandi for the sake of someone else. Those who on occasion have felt the many small gestures indicating we do not belong understand the power in small gestures that affirm. We know the power of extending across differences to say, I see you and I'm with you. The second gift we can offer each other is surprise. People surprise me all the time, by which I mean, people turn out to be much more complex and capable than um, I would have thought given my uh, tendency for stereotyping. It's always wonderful to find out that we're not quite as different as we seemed. My uncle Dwight, who recently passed away of COVID-19, was a general medical practitioner in the rural town of Gunnison in San Pete County. In 2020, in the midst of swirling political conflict, from a strictly political perspective, I might have been tempted to dismiss Uncle Dwight and people like him, whose political stance was the polar opposite of mine, as horrible people. But Uncle Dwight was one of the best people I've ever known. I remember once when he, yeah, he was always helping people. I was on my way to my cousin's wedding. We were trapping in a long caravan along a, an icy road in the middle of winter, and a car in front of us went off the road. Uh, I remember Uncle Dwight running over to the car. He was um, in the car for a while, um, working with the people in there, and eventually I saw him coming out, um, scooping up snow to wash out his mouth, which was full of blood. He tried to resuscitate one of the people unsuccessfully, but with no regard for his own safety, he had um, tried to do CPR on, the, on a man who had been in that car accident. Uh, he was always fixing people. He was always pulling them out of ditches when they were stuck. And um, just someone who was a pillar of the community and reliable uh, in every way, who worked so hard to get medical care to people. Um, my uncle Charles observed that while he didn't have a lot of enthusiasm for large scale government programs, um, government social programs, that's because he himself was a social program. He himself um, working so hard to heal the sick and to bring communities together. So we can be counter examples and alternate perspectives for each other. We can surprise each other with our humanity, our empathy, our competence, our vulnerability. This alternate perspective is as valuable as opening up a portal to another world. We can show ourselves to each other in our strengths and weaknesses and multidimensionality, giving each other the gift of not living in a world, for instance, either in the process of being ruined by a bunch of libtards or overrun with horrible Trump supporters. Who wants to live in a world full of horrible, stupid people? Instead, the gift of surprise opens windows and doors into a world of complexity, empathy, and brilliance a world full of sisters and brothers. The third gift we can offer each other that grows out of our differences is accountability. By accountability, I don't mean smacking each other down, but offering a corrective perspective just by being a presence in someone's life and a voice in their head. By just making ourselves visible in other people's lives and being in their lives, we can help people notice their blind spots. Of course, having blind spots or not having blind spots is not a matter of being woke or not woke enlightened or not enlightened. It's impossible for one single person in one national and cultural and linguistic and social and physical context, et cetera, et cetera, to see everything from every angle. Calling out that we are in someone's blind spot and if they come this way, they'll hit us is a way of taking care of people. No one wants to hit people, but sometimes we just can't see where we're going. We can also be aware that be, by being a member um, of a marginalized group from race to gender to sexual orientation to nationality, does not, na this does not magically vanish our particular blind spots. Everyone has them, I have them. Accountability, corrective perspective, being a presence and a voice in someone's life helps others measure their thoughts and experiences against some external guideposts. Just like a backup camera or a mirror, accountability provides angles that reflect more of the terrain of life to someone trying to navigate it. In 2009 and 2011, I worked with the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy and the City of Los Angeles Human Relations Commission to hold interreligious dialogues 
in the wake of the controversial Proposition 8 campaign in California, the um, ballot measure about same-sex marriage. We brought together several local religious leaders for dialogue on this issue. The median followed dialogue conventions developed by Randall Paul, founder of the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy. One of the tenets of good interreligious dialogue, according to Randall Paul, is that the interlocutors should be able to accurately repeat their partner's argument and to make this argument just as effectively as their partner can. When you can make the other person's argument for them, he says, that's when you know you're treating their ideas fairly. Accurately understanding and summarizing another person's concerns, even when they stand in opposition to your own, installs a little voice in your head. After that, wherever you go, you're able to hear their voice. It shapes what you say, what you post on social media, how you frame a discussion. Just by being in other people's lives and being who we are, we can come become a voice in their heads. In this way, they become accountable to us and we become accountable to them. My best, most effective writing happens when I reach out to people who are most likely to dislike it and ask for their direct and unrestrained feedback. This can be a painful process, but when I have more voices in my head, I'm able to get past the limits of my own experiences and assumptions and communicate more persuasively. How can we hope to get others to listen to our views if they feel that we do not see them or respect their agency and experience? The fourth gift we can offer each other is something worse. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying uh, we should look at other people's misfortunes and say, ha, 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 they're so pathetic. I'm so glad I'm not them. That's not what I'm saying. But it's just that I found a larger perspective of how difficult and terrible life can be is sometimes just what we need to do something hard. For example, uh, around the time, like uh, the same week, I think, that I was first diagnosed with cancer, a family member of mine began to go through a tough divorce. And um, over the course of my cancer and uh, the family member's divorce, we would kind of check in with each other. Still have cancer? Yeah. Still getting divorced? Yeah. And, um, and commiserate. Uh, but it was more than commiseration. It was also commiseration. It was also perspective. And just by seeing how hard and terrible life can be, it doesn't feel, one doesn't feel quite as put upon uh, or, or lonely when one is dealing with their own terrible things. Maybe I can offer you uh, something worse. I have been disemboweled and eviscerated. I have been poisoned more times than I can count. I've been filled up with a, well, I, I guess I filled myself up. My cells have filled myself up with a yellow looking fluid um, that is this massive fluid that totally filled my abdominal cavity, leaked into my lungs, made it hard to breathe. I had to lie on a table while they punctured my abdomen, stuck a tube in to drain it. I've had my abdominal cavity filled with boiling hot poisonous chemo. I've had horrible gastrointestinal systems, symptoms, which cannot be mentioned in public. I have a device installed on my chest that makes it easier to inject stuff into my veins. I've had various tubes passed into various orifices. I've been given very many grim diagnoses. I will get really excited when I live to see my credit card expire. By all means, if it makes you feel a bit better that none of these things have happened to you, if they haven't, feel better. Life is hard enough with all with our own problems. Thank goodness we don't have to all have each other's problems. Seeing other people doing hard things helps us realize how unreasonable it is to expect to get through life unscathed, to always be admired and popular, to always be hale and hearty, to feel secure. The truth is, no matter what your belief system, life can be really hard. Latter-day Saints believe that our sufferings are consecrated for our good, that they teach us lessons and develop our capacity for godliness. Seeing that everyone has to go about this in different ways makes us humble about our own comfort and hopeful about our own difficulties. The fifth gift is something material, but which, by which I mostly mean money and stuff bought with money. This seems pretty crass, especially to these other things like acceptance, surprise, accountability, and something worse. But money is a medium of exchange, a currency mediating value, time, support, and so on. Within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I have particularly seen how we give each other actual gifts, um, including actual money or currency or value. I thought a lot about this when I visited my father and mother-in-law when they served as Latter-day Saint mission presidents in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The chapels and buildings and the missionary support stipends, uh, the medical care and the humanitarian services I observed, I saw a massive redistribution of wealth from some areas of the global church to others. 
I also thought a lot about money at the beginning of the pandemic, specifically Latter-day Saint fast offerings. Our ward was off, asked to volunteer at the Bishop's storehouse. I took my kid with me to fill orders. And we just, um, I, I could kind of see his eyes getting wide as we loaded up our cart with them. Huge cuts of meat, uh, gallons of milk, ice cream, cheese, uh, diapers, flour, pasta, cereal. Um, and he, he, at a certain point, he looked at me and he said, all this is just free? And I said, yes, it is. As Sharon Eubank puts it, it's, um, it's, uh, allowing people to eat, um, giving, giving food so that people can eat uh, elegantly funded by people not eating. It was just awesome. And um, it was fantastic to be, to, to know that we are part of this, of, of these networks where not just uh, thoughts and prayers, not just ideas, not just doctrines, but actual stuff uh, is circulated and redistributed. The sixth gift is burdens. Everyone has them and they are all incredibly different and daunting. When we bear one another's burdens, it can be sort of like spiritual cross training. Only dealing with one's own problems can be tedious and it can also introduce a sort of damaging repetition and it's tiring. My grandpa, a farmer, always had the mantra, a change is as good as a break. Now I'm not trying to be flippant here about the heavy, heavy burdens that we all must bear ourselves and that are borne by people in this audience. But if we believe that the purpose of life is to learn to become like God, our heavenly father and mother, they, of course, along with Jesus Christ, are the ultimate burden bearers. Christ, who has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, the God of heaven who looked upon our wretched hatred and wept, the Lord of the vineyard who hustled from one tree to another trying to save it. When we share our burdens with each other, we gain perspective, empathy, and even experience. I've always felt that the Latter-day Saints were the best chair setter-uppers and chair taker-downers in the world. Nothing gives me more joy than to be the first one to start taking down one, two, three chairs, setting off the chain reaction of Latter-day Saints, leaping up to take down all the chairs and stack them neatly, like golden retrievers bounding after a thrown stick. This eagerness to get in on the chair work is part of our slightly insane, <coughs> but theologically consistent desire to suffer together. Of course, it's obvious why shared suffering is a way better bonding experience than shared anything else, conversation, games, you name it. And we, the Latter-day Saints, want to do things together. But how can we share suffering when our experiences and circumstances are so different? When it's not shared, but our mental states, our feelings, this or that traumatic memory. And what's the point of spreading sorrow around? Shouldn't we just try to contain it within ourselves? <coughs> Excuse me. I thought a lot about this question recently. The pandemic has been hard on mental health. My kids and I have struggled in various ways. It's hard to feel so connected to someone else when they're feeling down that you also feel down. I know from a certain point of view, it can be unhealthy to take on other people's sadness. We already have enough sadness on our own, but this is what happens when people love each other and are connected. When those we love mourn, we mourn. And what I can say is that when I feel a child's or another person's emotional burden, when I see also even little moments of laughter, of buoyancy, these become occasions for so much joy. I learned to prize these beautiful moments like gems in the coal heap of existence. And I learned more about the world's sadness. I am more aware of what people look like when they're in pain. Seeing more in this way is seeing more as God sees. We can't take these burdens on our own, of course. We need to rely on Christ to help us bear them. Since he has taken these burdens onto himself already, you can slip into the yoke and not be crushed, but just walk alongside him. It can be a good place to find him. We know this is where he is and what he does. It's time to conclude, so let me just review. All of God's creation speaks to the power of difference, the essentialness, essentialness, essentiality, the essential nature of difference. Difference is the way God designed the world and all things therein. As it says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. This mortal life is a time to circle and stew amongst this difference, being enriched by it and enriching others. I'm no expert on the afterlife, but I wonder if eternal life means a circle or a cycle instead of a straight line. 
sometimes people lay out this vision of eternal life, like the yellow letters scrolling through outer space in the Star Wars movies. You get to a certain point and then you move beyond it and then beyond and further still on and on. But that's only one way to de depict infinity. What if we never get beyond all this? What if this is what there is, but we just get more and more resilient, more and more perspective, more and more multidimensional and more and more able to access joy. If there's anything we learn about in the natural world, it's about constant change, but also a constant cycling, returning, reintegrating, eternal renewal. Who's to say that the differences that shape our perspectives and create our gifts never converge into one single homogenous state of becoming like God in the sense of everyone becoming the same type of being? Suppose instead, the more we understand of each other, the more we are connected, the more our personalities and patterns of living are shaped by others, the more distinctive and unique we become. Is this what God means by one eternal round? Sometimes the gaps between us are dark, frightening chasms. Sometimes the thought of what if this now is what there always is, is absolutely devastating. I know this fear well, and I know you do too. We're all in different situations, so I can't prescribe anything for anyone, but I can share my own experience from where I stand. So often in the past few years of dealing with a deadly malady, I have been at the very edge of not only my endurance, but of existence itself. At these times, God has brought me back from the brink. There was a time, for instance, when the doctor said, sorry, you're inoperable. There's cancer in your small intestine and you are on chemo for life. I said, can't you just remove part of the small intestine? They said, no, sorry, too much of it is affected and small intestines are important. I pleaded with God to give me more time. I received many blessings from my family and friends. And one day I got a scan and the cancer in the small intestine was gone. I could be operated on now. I could receive other treatments. I was still cancerous, but I wasn't a completely lost cause. It was miraculous. But to be honest at the time, I was a bit impressed. I'm sorry, a bit unimpressed. And I know it's ungrateful to say, but I'm just being honest. I said to God, this is ridiculous. Why have you fixed me a little bit? Why don't you heal me all the way? Why don't you take this burden from me, the whole thing, once and for all? Just to clarify, I don't think God gave me cancer to teach me lessons. I don't think God gives anyone cancer. I don't think God gives anyone um, suffering. I think the world is designed in a certain way. These things just happen. Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother designed the world as a place of learning, which includes learning through joy and also learning through pain. But the huge difference that cancer has introduced into my life, separating me from the realms of the healthy, from the people who make long-term plans, from the fearless, has not been without value. From having to deal with this for such a long time, I have seen more. I felt more. I've been more. I've been terrified, despairing, suffering. Yes, but more. I would never, ever choose the paths I've taken. But having taken them, I think I can understand just a little more the mind of God and the heart of Christ. I do believe that this is the purpose of life, to see as God sees, to love as Christ loves. They love us doggedly, particularly in our various states. Acceptance, surprise, accountability, something worse, something concrete and burdens are just some of the many gifts shaped by our, and motivated by our difference. These gifts are necessitated by the large empty spaces between us and able to transform and enlarge us into the measure of God, our heavenly parents. Our differences create a world of human interactions that is rich, fertile, and spiritually sustainable. Like the beauty of a world with geese, ducks, herons, and pelicans, and like the hazards of a world with mountain lions and deer, the beauty and hazards of human difference are life-sustaining. Eternal uniformity sounds like a prison sentence, a straight line into nowhere. But with the design of difference, the collective life of a society of eternal intelligences is dynamic, ever evolving and complex. May we learn to cherish our differences and give each other rich gifts of perspective and experience and grace. As we crisscross the spaces and gaps between us, we will grow more fully into the measure of our divine nature and linger in the places where the savior dwells. This is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, Sister Inouye. That was quite a wonderful 
block of instruction. I'm 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 just taken aback by uh, by your message tonight, and I hope that each of you that were that are following along, that are listening tonight or in the future, as you uh, as you watch this fireside, that you will learn something. I hope that, it, uh, at least for me, I learned that I need to be more comfortable with my differences. Let them shine. Uh, and also really appreciate and cherish the differences of the people around me. Um, in case you want to know more about Sister Inouye's work, again, her published works, uh, look into these. They sound really interesting. Uh, first one is China's True Jesus, Charisma and Its Limits in Chinese Christianity, and also uh, the book Crossings, a bald Asian American Latter day Saint woman scholar's venture through life, death, cancer, and motherhood, not necessarily in that order. Thank you again for coming tonight. Again, watch for announcements regarding the upcoming conference in June. We have a lot of wonderful things coming up on the plate. We'll have a great full conference for those who are able to attend or view uh, virtually. Our closing prayer tonight will be given by Ricardo Rosas, and then we will adjourn until the next time we get to meet. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the many blessings we have and the opportunity to be reminded and to learn new things and how to see the world and diversity from Melissa. We thank thee for having knowledge and understanding and for having the spirit as we walk through our journey. We ask the Heavenly Father to bless us too. I always feel thy love. And as we feel thy love, um, to be able to feel and be guided on how we're going to walk through our lives, how we're going to relate to each other. What give are we given to us and to others around us? We ask thee to always have thy spirit with us. And in the times that things are hard, that we can remember how special we are and how mindful thou art of us. We ask you to bless all of us in our community and also the people that we are in touch with. Bless us with the ability to be a light to others. Bless us to be able to when we're guided by the Spirit to share our stories with others and help us to us have thy love and protection and bless our families wherever they are. And we say these in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.